What happens when law, business, and life collide? Each week on Lead Council, your host Tom Tona will take a deep dive into topics related to the law, the business of law, and life. There will be insightful discussions with industry insiders, experts, and thought leaders making significant contributions and meaningful differences in their fields of expertise. Tom is the founder and managing attorney at Tona Law. He has been a practicing attorney since 1994 and the leader of Tona Law since it opened in 2001. The goal of this podcast is to provide you with free information on law and the business of law and to give you actionable tools related to each of these areas. Now, here's Tom. All right. Welcome to the Lead Council Podcast. It's your host, Tom Tona. I'm here with Juliet. Jules, Hello. you know the guest we have today. Yep, great guest. John Hawkins. I, I met John on LinkedIn. I've had the pleasure of getting to know him. We went out to dinner one night at a mastermind. I think we were at uh, GLM, right? Great Legal Marketing. That's right. John's got a niche that I'm super fascinated in, maybe because I'm 55 and I'm thinking about succession planning, right? So John, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. So one, what's the name of your law firm? Let's start with that. So it's law firm. GC. Awesome. You know, it's funny. I talked to you about another guy who his focus is ethics, which is awesome. Is that your actual corporate branding? That is okay. by design. Did you change that from something else in the past? When I first opened it, it was sort of a rush job. I just had my name and I kept that for maybe a few months, but I knew I wanted a trade name. It took me a little while and I couldn't think of anything. I said, screw it. I go with this. At the time, the ethics rules required you have at least one lawyer's name in it. So my name was in it sort of, and then they changed that rule. So I took it out. Out. So awesome. it's by design, I'm, by design. I am not going to announce the name yet, but I got a banger that's coming and I'm going to be doing a, hopefully a trade name change at some point with a rebrand around it. I got to get the ethics stuff involved. I don't know anything about it, but I know in New York, they changed the rules too, which I think is awesome. And so, yeah, I'm going down that road as well. Where are you based out of? I noticed an accent. Yeah, I'm based in Atlanta. So I'm down South. Gotcha. Very nice. Very nice. But you also have attorneys in in your firm that have licenses elsewhere, right? Correct. We do work really all over the country. You know, there's some states we don't do work in, but yeah, we have done stuff all over and I'm trying to add licenses so we That's can do awesome. it. So we can do it everywhere. Yeah. Look, being general counsel to law firms, is that your emphasis or are there other businesses you do it with as well? That is my emphasis. That's what I market. I mean, we do handle some non-law firm clients as well, some legacy clients. And some of my lawyer clients refer me business clients that are not lawyers too. Right. So it translates, right? It translates what you do. But I think a buddy of mine does it too. I think I introduced you to him out of Florida. But the need for this is massive. And the messaging that you guys are putting out is, you know, you could do this the hard way or you could do it the easy way. But a lot of times you're going to need a Jonathan on, you know, retainer to kind of help you go through the different phases of law firm opening, growing, terminating, or, or some other variation that corporations go through. So let's dive right in. Your background is in engineering. Yeah. Is that right? I was an engineer, undergrad. And you're a second generation lawyer? I am. I'm a third generation engineer and second generation lawyer. So mom or dad? Dad. Dad. What kind of lawyer was he? He did a little bit of a few different things. We grew up on the Gulf Coast, so he did some oil and gas law. He did some nice. commercial real estate, and then he did some litigation. All right. How long ago was he practicing? He still does a little, but he's officially retired. So he'll sit on a bench, I think once a month and do some little trials. I'm not sure what it is, some hearings. And then he's got people calling him every now and then. I got I got an email today from somebody trying to find him and they said, I need your dad. I have a problem. <laughs> officially, he's sort of of counsel with my firm now. I was going to say, is yeah. he of counsel? Yeah. Makes so, sense. That must be awesome. Listen, my dad is no longer with me and I would love the opportunity to, hey, dad, come into the office once a week. Let's go grab lunch, you know, type of thing. You know, I don't know if we could have actually worked together back in the day, but, <laughs> right. you know, when I was a teenager, I'm sure a lot of people have this story. We butted heads a lot. And then in college, we still butted heads. But then when I went to law school, that was when we sort of, our relationship got closer because he would call me almost every day. He's like, hey, what happened today in, you know, in class? And then as I've, you know, my career Years progressed, I can call him and say, Hey, what do you think about this? And frankly, he's the one who gave me the idea to get into this practice area. So I owe it all to him. That is awesome. Cause it's such, I think a fantastic niche. Talk about like blue ocean, right? You and two other guys are the only ones I know up and down the East coast doing it. And I already know, cause we share a coach. Don't you coach with Patrick Wilson? About to start, but yes. Oh, I know right, Patrick. right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after talking with Patrick, I know he's already referring business, he right? Is. He's already he referring business. 
which is awesome. And I think it's funny because you and I, I think, get along because you have this appetite for growth that I've observed just in the way you post on LinkedIn. The fact that you're going to add licenses across the country, that's going to be big. I mean, you talk about a blue ocean, man. You should give your dad a kiss and be like, dad, this was a great idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I owe it all to him. So I, yeah, I'll tell you the background. So I grew up as a business litigator and I was doing business divorces for closely held businesses, not law firms. And he handled maybe three or four law firm breakups down where I grew up, which is probably a 10th of the size of Atlanta. And he said, you know, I'm doing a bunch of these. There's got to be a bunch of these in Atlanta. You should check it out. So I just started looking around and there wasn't really anybody that was telling the world that's what they did. And I just went down the rabbit hole, figured it out, started telling people and slowly grew it. And so that was probably 14 years ago or so. That is awesome. You're in the right place at the right time. So shows like this, where we talk about succession plan, right? Listen, who knows? Maybe the five people that listen to this, they ain't going to do anything. But I will tell you that, you know, I'm interviewing right now for trial attorney, right? And they're a rare breed. And some of them have 10 years of experience. Some of them have 20 years of experience and they're trying cases. And I had the epiphany of, if I don't come up with a succession plan that includes a partnership track, I'm not getting what I want for talent. I'm just not. It's part and parcel of the whole thing. Not to mention, Jules and I talked to somebody, I forget who we were talking to, and they're like, well, you could always die at your desk. And I'm like, that is not what I plan on doing. Definitely not. So the bulk of your work is it law firm succession planning, mergers, acquisitions. Like right now, today, what is the bulk of the work that you're doing? So I would say, you know, people come to me, it depends on the time of year. This time of year, people are moving law firms, you know, there. And so I get a lot of work this time of year. But I'd say two areas of the bulk is forming new partnerships. And whether it's two different people coming together or a senior associate being elevated, whatever, or as part of a succession plan, you know, coming up with partnership agreements. The other part is law firms breaking apart. Mm. And so that's those are the two big areas, but succession planning more and more and more is becoming, you know, I guess as people get older, they're thinking about it. So doing more of that. And then we do lots of little things in between too. They should be thinking about it, right? Like if you think about the fact that we're the one profession that people get called in to do not only issue solving, problem solve, but planning. So they're not issues. Our field is so horrific at actual succession planning for themselves that the diet your desk model is probably predominant, I would say. Do you still think it's the most predominant model where guys just drop dead? Yeah, yes, unfortunately. So what happens when a law firm owner drops dead and then there's no partner involved? It's a show. I'll say that. It is a show. And I've had to step in for this. So, you know, before I started my firm, I was a partner at a firm. And I think maybe within the first year, me being a partner, one of our partners passed away. And we had six of us that could come together and figure it out. That worked okay. But I've, I've been called in where it's a solo or a solo owned firm and somebody suddenly dies. And if they do not have a plan in place, it is really a mess. And the family is just sort of there like, I don't know what to do. What, what do we do? And, right. you know, you're, it's really you're trying to triage the practice, make sure no malpractice is happening here or there, find the homes for the clients and that sort of thing. Hopefully they have some staff that stay on for a while, but sometimes they don't. But if they had a plan in place on the front end, it would be more orderly. There might be a way to monetize the practice in a better way. Lots of things you can do right. if you plan for it. Right. Versus like a fire sale of like 10 cents on the dollar, 25 cents on the dollar. Jules, if I drop dead, are you going to stick around? I'm taking over. <laughs> uh, prior to the idea with your father and the development of the business plan, when you first started 15 years ago, going down the rabbit hole that you have niched into, the vertical, right? You are general counsel to law firms and you're going to focus on lawyers. How did you convince lawyers they needed you? Because this is just coming into vogue now. So like that had to be a hard hole, especially because lawyers are notoriously cheap, notoriously difficult to work with and think they know everything. All of the above, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Not me, not you, but yeah, other people. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. It, it was interesting. So, you know, I did it all while having a full-time sort of business litigation practice, but I went out, I've told the story to folks, I went out and bought all these treatises and all these things, and I was just learning about it. And I was always pretty good about going to lunch with lawyers. I went to University of Georgia, so a lot of my classmates were here in Atlanta, and I would just tell them about the things I was learning. It was really fascinating to me, and some of them are sort of scary kind of things. And then I started writing about it a little bit, and I started doing some just pro bono work for my friends. Hey, I'll just do this for you. Let me, let me do it for you. And so I did that for a while. And then at some point somebody referred me my first paying client. And then it was just like, boom, it was the coolest nice. thing ever. 
Nice. And it took a long time. I mean, it took a long time to build it. And, you know, around here, I had a pretty good name and a good reputation. I've been doing it long enough. I'm getting a lot of referrals. But then when I really got active on LinkedIn a little over a year ago, it really, really exploded. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That, and then you compound that with when you start to do the masterminds that you're in. I believe you did one GLM, right? Great that's right. Marketing. So you're part of Ben Glass and Brian Glass's group. Shout out to those guys because they're the OGs in the mastermind space. They're talking about you presenting to the group and you're in a room with what, 40 lawyers around a table? You know, it, it's fun because I want to scale too and they do mm -hmm. too. So I'm learning from them, but then also I'm giving them some, you know, business related stuff that maybe they're not thinking about. To me, it's just a matter of when I put you on retainer, not if, because a hundred percent I'm in the midst of it. So once the plan is done, it's got to go to the lawyers that do the paper. I don't do any of that transactional stuff. I know nothing about it other than I've made commitments that I will have one by the end of the year in terms of a succession plan and a partnership track, right? Because some Somebody might want in on partnership on, I have three verticals. They may not want the other two verticals. They may want one vertical. So I've kind of made it and I've voiced it. And now I'm putting it on the podcast that my deadline is by December 31st, if not by June 30th, to have a sketched out plan that then is at the lawyers for paperwork, that type of stuff. So yeah, I think for you with the masterminds, when Brian was talking about it on LinkedIn, Brian Glass, you know, he said, oh, we got a master's class in succession planning from John Hawkins, which I thought was awesome. Like, you know, you and I talked about it over dinner that night with Herb and Eric, right? So yeah, people have to start thinking about it. It's a business. Why'd you build the business? Yeah. And you know, I mean, you know, this, you've mentioned it already. You know, we have these ethics rules we got to sort of maneuver. Right. And, you know, I, I'm also an ethics lawyer at this point. And there are some ethics lawyers that basically say no, 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 no. To everything. And so I, I take that. a different I approach. That, John. I say, look, these are the lanes. These are the bumpers we need to sort of maneuver maneuver between, but we'll figure out a way to stay within bounds of the ethics rules, but get you to the place you want to get to. And if we can't get exactly there, we can get pretty close. Is your New York guy also versed in New York ethics, that type of stuff? I would imagine so. I mean, he's, okay. he, he had to take the bar. So. Is he located in New York or is he located in Atlanta? He's in Atlanta now. He worked in New York oh, out of okay. law school for oh, a while. That's nice. Okay, good. Yeah, he was a he was a big time M and A at one of the big firms there in New York for a while. Ah, oh, nice. Yeah, that's a nice score. That's a good score to have that. And again, I think that it's it's kind of an untapped market because yeah, maybe people are going to jump into it, but I don't know. This is the one thing to me that if you're a law firm looking to scale from seven to eight figures, let's say, because that's my seven to eight figures, you gotta have people like you on retainer, right? If you're gonna be absorbing practices, don't do it half ass. Right. And so to me, it's really important, which is for you is amazing as a business model. So good for you. So for the lawyers that are listening to this, that are like, I don't need John. I'm a lawyer. Even though I'm a personal injury lawyer, I don't need John. What's the message? Say, uh, there's a lot more to this than you doing as kind of a part-time hobby while you practice PI. Well, I'd say for the PI attorneys, you need me or somebody like me probably more than, than other types. Hell yeah. So let, let me tell you the story. This is the common story. <laughs> Every PI firm owner, you know, their biggest fear is they're going to bring in somebody younger. They're going to give them a portfolio of cases. And we all know that there are no restrictive covenants that apply to lawyers and clients can choose whoever they want. So you come in, introduce 150 or however many or 20 really big clients to your associate. And then one day they say, Hey, I'm leaving and I'm taking the clients with me. That is a scary proposition when you're trying to build a firm. And again, there are certain rules that apply that we can't lock down everybody completely, but there are things you can do. And in my opinion, that is part of building the firm, building the business and going towards succession planning. So for the PI firm owners, they need it. Now I'll say this, I've seen them, some agreements they have, and they think they're smart and they think they lock things down. They probably wrote them themselves, but they're not enforceable usually, right. at least right. the ones right. I've seen. Yeah. Look again, you hope for the best, you prepare for the worst, right? So you're a lawyer's lawyer, right? And I always say like people like you, like I'm a, just a street fighting guy and I get into the ring and we do whatever we got to do. What's it like representing only lawyers? I feel like they make the worst clients. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. Jules, are you kind of talking about me in that mix? I don't, I don't know. know. Tom, listen, if all lawyers are half as difficult. How as dare seen, you? Well, not in, difficult in a good way. That don't sound so But then, so you know, I'd be a little nervous representing them. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, well, there's a spectrum. I'd say most of my clients I really like. The ones that perhaps maybe I wouldn't like, they decide they don't need me. So they sort of, it solves itself. Okay. Then I wonder if they like end up looking back and being like, wow, like I really needed him. I should have stayed. 
Maybe. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about that. So I have one friend who did it really successfully. She had this powerhouse law firm. She did it really successfully. Do you work as part of a, you mentioned before M&A, do you work as part of a team that involves valuation experts and accountants and other lawyers? Do you do you work as part of a team when you got something like a, an eight-figure law firm being kind of next level succession? The bigger firms, I would say, generally they've got, you know, they'll go get valuation, formal valuations. The smaller firms, it might be back in the napkin. Okay. For personal injury firms, there may be some different ways. You might see what the portfolio is at, at some given moment and estimate what the value is and sort of come off of that. Definitely on CPA and some of the financial information, I am not a tax attorney. I'm not a CPA. So I defer to them and refer my clients to those people to get other views. I've had some clients, they will have a CFO type or a, like you've got, or some sort of financial analyst who's running spreadsheets and yes. you know really complicated stuff. I don't really do that. Again, I would send that to somebody else. I can do back of the napkin. But when you get bigger and bigger, I really think you need a team. Another aspect, particularly when two firms are sort of merging the back office technology integration piece, you know, you almost need like an operations person to really make gotcha. that happen. That gets pretty complicated. I don't do that either. So it really right. depends on the deal and the size. Interesting. Wow, there's a lot that plays into it. I was going to just say, like, you look, yeah. you look overwhelmed, Jules, because you also know, like, look at yeah. what we got going on. We're trying to integrate. Uh, case management software. We have two different mm -hmm. case management softwares that if somebody was going to come in and be like, all right, it, we want to merge or we want to buy or whatever. That would be like just the transition <laughs> on the software side was something I never thought of until you just brought it yeah. up, John. Like that's a pretty crazy. Well, then there's the other piece, which I know you're really good at because I know you talk about it on your podcast, but the culture oh. piece, you know, you're melding two cultures together mm -hmm. and you guys from listening to your podcast, you guys got to figure it out. Uh, I've learned a lot, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. And so if you're merging with another their practice. They need to do what you're doing versus the other way around is what I would say. So, And it's funny. I was on a phone with a call and that came up like, okay, if you're going to do a departmental installation, right? You read about these big white shoe firms. They're like, oh, the bankruptcy department at so-and-so just jumped ship to so-and-so. And I'm looking at a scenario like that right now. Cause you know me, man, I'm always kind of moving on something, but I'm looking at something like that. And the advice I got was not financial. It was what you just said, which is cultural alignment. Right. And ah, oh, man, that sent shudders up my spine because our culture is so important. It is everything. How do you assure in a merger scenario or a departmental acquisition, for lack of a better word, how do you assure cultural alignment on a multiple person scale versus a one on one interview? Oh, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out right? How do you assure cultural alignment at mass? Well, nothing's ever hundred percent sure, but I think, you know, let's say you're acquiring a group. Number one, I think as part of the interview or the sort of the dance, the courtship, you need to make sure this is what we believe. And you need to not just talk to the head person. You need to talk to everybody. Everybody sure you're going to hire, basically. Everybody. So you, Tom, would sit down with every person and not rely on the lead over there to translate to the rest of the team, because you want to make sure you've said it and you've answered their questions. That's number one. Number two, I think as part of that courtship is, you know, assuming you are acquiring a group, there needs to be in no uncertain terms. You can be nice about it, but this is your firm and your culture and it's going to be done your way. This is, you know, long term. Yeah. It, this is not a democracy. It may sound kind of harsh, but. Well, you know what? Part of my culture is a democracy within, like you used the word lanes or bumpers before, right? So one of the things that I have done is I realized that as good as my interviewing skills could be, in terms of my antenna, I actually have incorporated Patrick Wilson into the hiring process on the high level stuff. So if I'm meeting with trial attorneys, those are big hires for me, right? Big price tags, big hires. It's important. I have a high level headhunter that I've been using and they're on EOS, dude. Oh. I have never seen headhunting like this before in terms of legal recruiting. And they have yielded fantastic results. They've been on EOS for 10 years now. So they they are going through test after test and they just do a deep dive analysis. So kind of know who I'm talking to before I get on the phone. They do an interview, preliminary phone. I do a one hour 
phone, then a two hour face to face. Then they talk to Patrick Wilson for an hour by Zoom. Then we get down to the last two hour nitty gritty of, cause you're not asking a trial guy, Hey, do you know how to do BPs? You're asking a trial guy about verdicts, revenue production, and culture is important to them. If, if, cause there's a lot of trial guys that have unique personalities. If they're like family first, people oriented where, you know, it's a bigger picture play, right? So culture is important for them as well. Uh, that's an amazing insight that you gave, which is even on a hire, one individual hire, it's about culture alignment for me, right? And Jules has seen it. Jules is kind of the poster child of the culture of this firm, to be honest with you. We designed our cultural vision around Jules and a couple of other people, right? Going through the EOS exercise. So I think that's really astute thing, John, like you're saying. And it should be me and or you're saying it should be me and or my integrator, Janira, with each individual. If there are 10 people in the department, we're doing 10 individual interviews. I think so. I think okay. so. Because, you know, one bad apple, one bad apple. Yeah. Well, the, the good other, thing is, yeah, go ahead. So the other good thing, you know, it sounds like you've already, I mean, you were designing a nice pre-screening, I'll call it process. And then yeah. I know you guys have a really robust onboarding process, which is the other side of the coin, which is important too. Once they're there, yeah. you got to make sure they become part of what you guys have. You can't just throw them in a room, give them a desk and say, well, I'll see you in six months. Yeah. Yep. Well, I will tell you, it's not as robust as I would like. It's, I did not realize the importance of onboarding. I was like, I'm great at hiring and I'm great at managing. I was horrific at onboarding. We didn't have a process. We started the process with our prior HR person. If you weren't doing what you're doing and it seems like you really enjoy it, like I always see you got a smile on your face, you're really into the marketing side. What would you be doing if you weren't doing that? Great question. I love business. I, I, I've got the shiny object syndrome too. I, you know. See, Jules? I feel like all great leaders and entrepreneurs too. It is what it is. <laughs> I was doing stuff as a kid and, you know, I've just sort of, it's been in my blood and, you know, I went to engineering school. It was sort of a business engineering degree. I thought I was going to go into finance or develop commercial real estate or something. That was something that was interesting to me. But if I wasn't doing this and this is my second career, I already know when I exit, I'm going to promote, I'm going to concert promote. I'm going to put on shows. Really? Yeah, that's what I want to do. I may that's start, awesome. I may start doing it just for fun. You know, I've that's been trying awesome. to get some friends to do it with me. I love that idea, but I do know that it's very capital intensive and it's, you got to be okay losing money for a while before you're, before well, see, you can get it. So well, that's part of it. I don't, I don't know if I'd actually, actually do it for money. I would do it, you know, say, look, I'll get five friends that we all, we just love music and we'll just have a committee. We'll pick who we're going to have. It'll be semi-private. We'll form a company. We'll put investment in it. And if it loses money, then it's, it's a write-off, right? So right, right, right? And we right, get, right. To, we get to see the show we want to see and meet the band and all that. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. So are you a musician? Uh, you know, I grew up, I was a drummer. I don't have time to do a whole lot of that now, but I still love it. And uh, that might be another thing I would do. But you just said you don't have time for it a lot more. Why? Why would you build a life that you're not having time for what you love? Well, I love growing my firm. I love it. It's okay. fun and it's a challenge. And that's what I'm focused on. So, I mean, there are a couple of non-negotiables. You know, I'm home for dinner every night. So I, I do that and I work out every day. Uh, so I book awesome. in my days that way. But the challenge of growing a firm is fun for me. And so I don't even think it's work. I mean, sure, there are days where I'm busy, super busy. I'm working on the weekends. Sometimes I'm working at night. But it doesn't feel like work to me. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because I love it, right? And I was talking to you, you know, Seth Price, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Seth? So I don't Seth know him, is, but know who he okay. is. Yeah. So he runs not one, but two eight-figure businesses. He's actually, he was on the podcast last week. I think it's coming out tomorrow, right, Jules? Mm -hmm. I always look at him and I go, oh, man, when you hit eight figures, it's got to be easy. And I'm like, no, it's not, right? It's messy as hell. But if you love the process, like you're saying, it doesn't feel like work. Like, I hardly ever work on a weekend anymore. I worked like last Saturday, right? My wife was like shocked, but I was working on the business and I was working through some issues that we struggle with, with EOS, right? So there's no problems. It's just issues. And I love that puzzle piece figuring out thing, you know, like, yeah. so I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I get it. I see where you come from. Yeah. Like that is a passion, right? And I mean, that's what they say the key to success is, right? Just doing what you love and fully loving what you're doing every day. And then work doesn't feel like work. Yeah. And it's, you know, for me, I want, I want to 
grow a really big firm. I know it's going to add headaches. I know it is, but I just want to see if I can do it. I mean, so really. have you, are you doing EOS? Are you doing anything like that right now? I've read Traction probably three times. I am self-implementing some of it. I've read the Scaling Up, the Vern Harnish version two. Yep. I, I don't think we're quite big enough yet. Okay. So, you know, last year is when I decided I had a lifestyle firm forever. It was right. me and a contract attorney. And then, uh, you know, I was getting work and I said, all right, let's, let's do it. So then last year I went from one and a half to four and a half people. And so we're going into this year. I added, I've added the other person. I think we may add, there's a couple of things in the works. We could add two to six people this year. Uh, wow. So it's a lot of growth. And every time you add it all those is. people, you know, it's just oh. a new layer of complexity. As you okay. were saying it, I was like, okay, so you add four people, but communicate complexity is like 16, 17 times more complex. And they don't teach you this in law school, right? Which is what I was hoping to do. And I think you're doing also on your podcast where, you know, somebody's listening to this and they're about to break six figures in their firm, right? Oh, I can tell you what problems are coming your way as you cross over 500, as you cross over a million, as you cross over two and three, and it compounds exponentially as you grow. And Seth's advice, I won't give away too much, said, go from 1 million to 10 million, that's easy. When you want to go 10 to 20 to 30, that is real hard. And so I was like, it really dispelled a lot of those myths that we build up like, you know, oh, guys like Craig Goldenfarb, oh, he's got it easy. I go look at his operation. When I went to the John Fisher thing, it was at by Craig's office and it was late. And we were exhausted. And I went there on Friday night and I'm looking at 30,000 square feet that this guy built out. You need a space planner. So my office is 4,000 square feet. We'll grow out of it eventually. We're close to it now, but it's seven times the size of this. And he made it look seamless, but it required space planning, years of construction. Like I was getting palpitations just thinking about it. So when you think you want to do big, right? Like you want to build big. I want to build big. Well, it's crazy. The other thing too, I mean, I want to go multi-state. Me too. Uh -huh. If you add an office in the same state, that's some complexity. I think a lot, but because right. you're managing two offices, but then you go across state lines and then maybe you add three or four and man, it's daunting. But again, I want the challenge. I, I really do. Yeah. Yeah, I love that model. Marco Brown was on here talking about becoming a multi-state matrimonial firm. I love that we finally have these big thinkers that are like, wait, there are no multi-state matrimonial firms. He's figured out what he wants to do. He's narrowed it down by market. He actually has gone into what are the politics in the state? Do I want to be in the state or not? You know, Marco, he's kind mm -hmm. of a live out loud kind of guy. But I love that because it pushes all of us in a better direction, right? It's not confined to big law to be multi multi-state, just got to have the right business model. Matter of fact, it's funny. I'll tell you, I was thinking before when you said it is I'm good friends and I don't want to say her name because I don't know if she's going to come on or she wants to talk about it, but we were at the mastermind together and she's a fairly innovative entrepreneurial PI attorney out of Las Vegas. And if I said her name, you probably know it, but she invests in law firms at this point. They could be anywhere, right? Because attorney to attorney, as long as you have the license in the state, what are your financial needs? What's the split going to be? Get it lawyered up with the right lawyers like you, like your practice that can understand a multi-state practice and the challenges of that. And all of a sudden now you're multi-state, right? You're a national law firm. And I love that. I love that. So so when did you have the aspiration to go multi-state with this model? I did realize that there is this blue ocean. Oh, I'm jealous in a lot of ways. And I looked around and, you know, there are people that do what I do. There are people that do some of what I do and there are people that don't do some of what I do. And so there's not much out there. Now, part of what I have to do is educate lawyers that, you know, it's worth and they need it and it's worth it. So that's part of it. But when they do know it and they hire me, they usually stay on basically forever, sort of on speed dial. But part of it was, I mean, it really was, I did not want to be 20 years from now and say, I should have done it. I should have done it. And I certainly didn't want to be 20 years from now watching somebody else who did it. I was like, no, right. I got to right. do it. I know I can do it. <laughs> I know there's a need. There's nothing out there. I'm going to do it. So, and, and I mean, look, even with the blue ocean and all that stuff, it's still, it's not easy. It's not easy. And again, that's what I like about it. Yeah. I, and you know, what's funny. So Jules, you hear a common thread, right? Like, so he started out where he identified the opportunity and then he did tons of self-study, which was what like guy like Mark Whitehead out of Texas. I don't know if you know, Mark, you should have him on your podcast, John. He's awesome. Mark does veteran and disability cases, right? He does. And he basically same thing. He had a personal injury background, a little different from you 
but he had a personal injury background. He identified a blue ocean, knew nothing about it. He got books and he studied it. Now, another great person we had on here was a guy, Jeff Kitchhaven. And Jeff said when he wanted to be a private mediator, he saw his opportunity to cash out of private practice and he started by doing work for free, right? And I talk about this stuff because I want people that hear this to think, don't look at John 15 years in. Look at what John did to get to 15 years in. Don't look at John when he opens up his 50th office in whatever part of the country it's going to be in. You got to see what's behind it, right? They're working for free, willing to sit down with tomes that we have to study from cover to cover on weekends and nights while you're trying to feed your family. Look at that stuff. Jules, you get to see that firsthand, right? Like you're talking to a guy like John or these other guests I'm talking about. Jeff yeah. Kitchhaven, that's how he became a mediator. Now he's a sought after mediator. People fly him all over the country. He's out of California. He's excellent. Everybody starts the share those paths, right? Of the sleepless nights, the uncompensated work that you put in to become an expert. So yeah, what you charge now is worth it, right? And I think that anybody that's listening to this, if you own a law firm, one of your first retentions should be, and I wish I did it much earlier, is ethics counsel. And if you're going to be a person who's cutting deals for partnership, got to have John on retainer, right? Like to me, why would I think I know anything about this other than I know how I want to negotiate a deal, but the paperwork and the protection and all the stuff that you provide for both parties, right? Yeah, you're going to represent one side, but a well-documented agreement really provides protection for both. Everything's kind of spelled out, right? Is there anything about that that's not accurate that I just said? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big believer. You anticipate what might go wrong and you, and you address it on the front end while everybody's still friendly because if it goes sideways and you don't have these things on paper, it, it is really bad. But I want to yeah. mention something, you know, the long haul, the overnight success that no one really sees. And I'll, I'll go back to sort of my science background is just an exponential curve. You know, for years, it looks like it's barely moving. And then right towards the end, it just shoots straight up. And it's, you know, that's how I approach everything. You know, just keep slogging away because it's moving. I just can't see it yet. It's funny because as you were saying it, I'm like, man, it's a slog. I know I've been there, right? Yeah. It's a slog. And then right when you think you can't take the pain anymore, the hockey stick happens, right? right. It's it's awesome that you just said that. So go over this with everybody. And I know I want to be respectful of your time or closing up in an hour. If you had to point to one big career needle mover, what would you say that was for you career-wise? You know, I could probably point to a few big points. Obviously, the first one was diving in on this niche. You know, before that, I was sort of a generalist business litigator, and it's hard to gain traction there. And I'm a big believer in picking a niche, maybe one to three areas that you become sort of the go-to person for. So that was huge. Recently, I think getting on LinkedIn was really big for me. That's how we met. That's, yeah. you know, led to this moment right now. Yeah. And that was a big one. Another thing that I mentioned earlier that's big for me that I think is important for everybody is we have a stressful job. Most lawyers do. And you got to relieve the stress and some hit the bottle. But I think a better way is exercise of some sort. And so that's a non-negotiable for me every day. I do it every morning. And there've been some times like during COVID, I didn't get to do it for a little while. And I started feeling, you know, I could feel it. I could feel the stress levels going up. So yep. those, are, those are three things for me. Yeah. And I think it's huge. And we have a few more minutes if you're good. Oh, I got time. I really want to kind of dive down because I think people don't understand. Let's put some real concreteness to those three needle movers for a second. There are new niches and blue oceans everywhere. I'm blessed. I talk to innovators like you. My whole circle of life is innovators. I surround myself with people that are innovative. I don't have time not to, right? So for me, I want to be around people that fascinate me. I will go back after this conversation and be like, where are the untapped niches that I'm missing, that I'm not seeing, right? And I'm friends with a guy who started out same as me, he's a PI guy, and he finds niches in mass torts and PI. I told you about him over dinner, and I'm like, how does he keep innovating? But it's just a mindset thing, man. If you're closed off, you will see nothing. If you're head down and you're not looking up, you will see nothing. If you're out there talking to people, you were talking to your father, you saw something, you didn't just dismiss it, and you're building your whole practice and your whole life around this mission that you have now based on that. So that mindset that you have, that's key. That is key. So I'd say another thing too, I did not have some grand vision way back when. I tried some other things first. I mean, I think it's iterative. I think you experiment, some things work, some things don't, and you just sort of gradually get there. You know, there I tried a few other areas way back when that I thought, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do this. And I probably could have made 
played a practice area out of them, but wasn't interesting enough to hold me there long enough. And this sort of was, and it's grown and changed over the years too. So to the lawyers out there that say, I got to pick the one thing now, I don't think you have to, and I don't think you should try to. It's just start edging to the things that interest you. And eventually you might pull something from here and something from there and then create something that didn't even exist before, which is yeah. sort of what I did. Yeah. You build a better mousetrap and all of a sudden now you got a business, right? And I did that with the verticals I have. There's a bazillion PI firms out there. But I said, we're going back to our trial routes this year. This year, I got four cases that are marked for trial. You'd be surprised what happens when you draw that line in the sand. It just changes things. So the second thing you brought up was LinkedIn. For the lawyers listening to this, John and I connect on LinkedIn. We meet up at a mastermind. I refer John business as I got to know him, right? Through LinkedIn. Sent you the first client last week already. I don't know if he's going to retain, not retain, but you got that referral. I'm sure I'm not the only one. I mean, you're so niched at what you do. There's got to be other people sending you stuff off of LinkedIn, right? So I think if people are listening to this, LinkedIn's been a needle mover for me as well. I've gotten PI referrals from across the country. I was at a mastermind. I got a call from a guy in Alabama who's like, I found you on LinkedIn. I got two PI cases I want to send you. I go, look, I'm in Florida right now at a different mastermind, but can I get you in touch with my intake? people. Boom, done, right? He's down as a referral source. I pay fee participation in all jurisdictions where it's ethical. And LinkedIn is a needle mover for sure. For sure. Well, the other thing, the other thing you mentioned, I think with LinkedIn is not just cases and, and business, but also like recruiting and that sort of thing, right? <sighs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So I'm doing these interviews and I'm, and I got a lot of really high quality candidates and they're all like, I follow you on LinkedIn and I've listened to all your podcasts and dude, you're doing it differently, right? So it gets the word out about your processes, right? Like Jules is on every podcast with me. So she kind of knows how I think if you're in a firm and John in your firm, uh, hopefully the people that work for you listen to your podcast because you're a genuine guy. You speak your mind. Listen, if I was working in a firm where I put in 40, 50 hours a week, kind of to know what's going on. What, what does the owner think about the people at the firm and, and how he thinks? You get an inside look to all of that. You're smiling, right? Like, yeah. I don't know if they listen or not, but I would think it's good to do. Well, well, they say they do. I don't know if they do. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, I don't they know. They might just say to your face. <laughs> Listen, my, my people might be like, we hear enough of your voice through the walls because you're so loud. They may not want to, but you know, again, I put out what I put out. I do know that a lot of people on the recruiting side, they repeat back what's on LinkedIn and in the podcast, right? The mission for me and probably for you is the same thing is I only want people that are like-minded, right? Our culture's our culture. So if they're not, I'd rather them be like, oh no, that is not for me. This guy is bad shit. I don't agree with him. You know, like you're laughing, Jules, but you know how I feel about it. Yeah, right? of course. I feel like LinkedIn has been monumental for like our growth on social media and with the podcast. And John, I know you said for you as well, you said it really took off in the past year. But ever since Tom started posting like pretty consistently on LinkedIn, I feel like it's just taken off in ways we didn't even imagine. What's awesome about it too with John, like John's authentic and I can tell you, you don't outsource it because I know how you talk and I've spoken to you at length over dinner and stuff, right? Like the key is you can't outsource it, mm -hmm. right? I don't want to follow somebody who's, it's clearly chat GPT or I want to hear what John's got to say about John's life experiences and that's why I, it resonates with me and I feel like I know John and I'm comfortable referring to him. He knows he's in the space that he's in, right? So for me, that's why LinkedIn, 100%, I would agree with you. It's been a huge needle. And I agree. The voice, for me, I write everything. And Tom, I know you do. I can tell. I mean, 100%. I, know, I know your voice. I know it. I know it. And it's it's exactly like like you speaking right now. Um, yeah, 100%. And I think the other thing that Jules said, which is key, is, is the consistency. You know, drive-by posting and, you know, every now and then here and there, that's not going to work. You got to do it all the time. And the other thing that probably has helped me, probably you too, Tom, is the it, it helps me formulate in my mind certain thoughts that I weren't sure were there before. You know, the act of posting and writing, I get ideas and I'm like, that's a good one. Maybe no one else thinks so, but I think so. And it, and it's, it, and it helps. And right, it, right, right, right. No, I, but I think what you're saying also is, is that when you're a student of life and, a, and an observer of people documenting that stuff, right? And all of a sudden, that's why masterminds I think are so awesome as well. Like so few people understand that entrepreneurial brain, like the people that sit around the masterminds with you, right? The stresses, the anxiety, 
anxiety, the, you know, as Jules and I call it, the broken brain ADD that I might have undiagnosed or diagnosed. I'm not diagnosed, but I'm fairly certain I have it. But that last needle mover is also something that is shared among the highest performers I've had on this show and that I meet at masterminds and stuff. You mentioned it as exercise, but the reality of it is, is it's an extension of mental health. I look at health and I, and I I almost did a post on it, which is if you go to the gym, but you don't meditate or something else for your brain, you're only doing 50% of the health picture, right? Because so for me, like I lift heavy things, you lift heavy things. Marco, I know is big on lifting and I also do jujitsu and you you also run, right? Do you do a lot of running? too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's Jules' thing, running. right? So things that are <laughs> yeah. purposely hard are actually saving our brains, both in a physical way, but also mental health. You, you brought it up in a way that we're in high stress positions. I used to feel, probably going back about 10 years ago now, I used to feel like if somebody was to do an MRI scan or a CAT scan of my brain, it would be glowing red or bright yellow from stress. Meditation was the game changer for me. Extreme exercise, right? I will work out every day. I had a cold. I couldn't, I didn't want to work out for 10 days. I wanted to let it run its course. But I went back, it wasn't fully gone. And I was like, I don't care if I'm on two miles an hour on the treadmill. I'm putting my 45 minutes in on the treadmill, right? I think at the higher level, even if it's physical exercise, what you're talking about is that mental health care for yourself, right? And I, a lot of what you're saying is why you're in the high performing masterminds you are, right? I know there's multiple levels to them, but all the high performers I talk to, same thing. I am going to get up every day early and get the gym in. That sets your tone for it, right? Now your endorphins are going, you know, for me, it's meditation. And you talk about it when you talk about the endurance running and how many problems you can solve that there are parallels between the struggle and the run. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, some of my best ideas come on the treadmill. They just pop in your, yeah, I got to make sure I can write them down on my phone. I think exercise, everybody needs it. I think we're, humans are built to move around and we need to do that. But even if it's, you know, playing a musical instrument or whatever it is, a lot of lawyers, particularly at the bigger firms, they put their personal life on hold and do nothing but work. And no wonder they're miserable. I mean, they they hate it. Miserable, divorced, drinkers. Somebody referred uh, in an interview and said, man, it's like you guys are next generation in the way you're approaching stuff. And by you guys, I mean like everybody on this call, right? You guys are all next generation in what you're doing versus the old guard, right? You could open up the bottle of scotch. I could have been that guy, by the way, because I, I'm doing this almost 30 years. I came up with the old guard. They went to the bar for lunch while they were on trial. They had liquid <laughs> lunches. It was like a running joke. There were drunk attorneys going back to court. No, I'm, I hand to God, one of my first trials back in the day I was at, I went to go get lunch at the bar and there was a line of attorneys just drinking scotch oh my for gosh. lunch. I'm not joking. Like that's what it was. But those guys all dropped dead from cigarette smoke and bad habits. And the new guard is, I don't drink anymore, but the new guard is, is you're going to get that hour work running or you're going to get that hour lifting. Juliet, same thing. Jules is one of the few people texting me at 4 30 in the morning when she's on the treadmill with marketing ideas. And I'm like, Hey man, I'm not texting you. You're texting me. So I just want it clear. Like I'm not bothering you till eight, but if she's having ideas for the podcast or something else, like even though she's young, she's that new guard of understanding. Like you could have both. You just have to design your life. 4 30. That's pretty good. You know, so. That's pretty Thank good. Thank you. I try. I try. Yeah. I don't know if she does that anymore. It used to be 4.30. Now it's probably like 5 I wake up at 5. I, I do yeah. wake up early, still getting up. Yeah, 4.30 is early. I'd really. say if it's... I, yeah, it is. I'd say five. I'm definitely out there. I do four thirty only because I like to squeeze in that meditation now, for 15 minutes. Now it's minutes. just cold in the morning. It's a little, a little more difficult, yeah. but over the yeah. summer, it's definitely a lot easier. So John, wh- what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Is it LinkedIn? Is it your website? Where do you want people to check you out and get in so touch with you? Definitely LinkedIn. Out? I would say, you know, send me a connection request. I will accept it. Just don't immediately try to sell me something, <laughs> which I know you posted about yeah, the other day, yeah. but yeah. Oh, Oh, it's the worst. It's the worst. And and then they get mad yeah. when you don't answer. Like, dude, we exactly. just met. I don't want to draw a reference that comes to mind, but it involves sidling up to somebody at a hotel bar and jumping ahead 10 steps with the conversation. Exactly. exactly. But yeah, you know, send me a connection you know. request on LinkedIn. Find me. I'll accept it. Website is www.yourlawfirmgc.com. Find me there. I think my email is on there awesome. too. So, uh, but I'll yeah, we'll sure put all the links. Link everything. And your podcast we'll, as well. I'll, I'll put a link to that 
Oh, that's right. Founding Partner Podcast. Tom, you're, you're coming on soon. And uh, we didn't talk about We got some good I'm stuff excited. to talk about that, that you're doing. So, so I'm excited. We're going to dive deep. I'm so. excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited. And anybody listening to this, please, please, please. John, do you charge for consultations? Not generally, but I mean, I'll give you, I'll give okay. you 30 minutes. I, I couldn't do that all day, but yeah, listen, I, I'm happy to talk to anybody. If you're listening to this, yeah, if you're listening to this and you're about to do something that changes the ownership of your law firm, whether it's merger, acquisition, even if you think about a merger, a friend of mine did a merger. I still don't understand what happened. I'm like, well, did you get a cash out of any kind? I was like, no. I was like, like. What I, I, I still can't wrap my head around it, and it's a pretty smart person, but please, if you're listening to this, just call John. He's going to give you 30 minutes over a cup of coffee. Figure out if you need him. And if you're doing anything other than law firm representation, you need him. You need him. So, John, thank you so much. When my fractional CFO and I are done designing the plan, it's going to go to your New York guy to handle the everything else. So I really appreciate what you're doing. I think you're doing.